Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 53 of the White Knuckle Podcast, powered by Ozonix. Undetectable, undeniable. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning back in to episode number 53, where we finish up uh, episode two of two with Mr. Lee Likoski. Uh I hope you guys had as much fun listening to this last week as I did recording it. It's just a ton of fun to get him and Todd in the same room, so to speak, and just listen to all the knowledge that they have. And we didn't even begin to scratch the surface. So look for Lee to come back on the show here in the future. With that, let's, uh, let's rejoin the show where we left it off last week. When, when, when is it, guys, that you guys think that a deer, in terms of age now, that a deer turns the corner in terms of, I don't want to say smarts, but in terms of its ability to interpret its uh, its surroundings, uh, you know, certainly they make a change. Like Lee, you reference, you know, it's, it's if you're rattling one in, it's likely a three year old. Um, but when when do you think uh, they what at what age do you think they're making that turn where they they just look at things differently? And I'm not I'm not so sure that it's that in their mind they've gotten smarter or anything like that. I think it's five and that's like even, um, and it it would be probably four for other areas. It just depends on, you know, how many older deer are on top of them. seems like, you know, during, you know, during the rut that, you know, obviously they're searching for does. So the older ones have them, they don't have to search and, you know, they don't, you rattle, it doesn't matter. They, they're likely if they're moving, they, you know, they know that there's does there and you, you'll see, you know, way before, like last, you know, October 20th, you can see all the little bucks out kind of chasing does around and grunting at them and all that stuff. And, you know, see an older buck comes out and just goes out and feeds. He might just nose around a little bit, but he's not chasing them or doing that stuff. And most times, the thing is when they hit five, at least for me here, when they hit five is when they, you know, they're just laying up and they're just, they're not going and checking and running, chasing does around. Just, okay, when first one comes in, I'm just going to go take her. It doesn't matter if they can be a three-year-old and been on her, following her around for four days and waiting for her to come in when she's ready. The big ones get up and go take it. So then that little one is go on to the next one, running around. And even at four here, you'll see them moving around a little bit more and and, and chasing does around at four. But at five, I never see that. And so to me, is where they turn the corner is at five. But I don't I don't know that it's necessarily in their mind that they're smarter. I suppose some, you know, they've been through breeding season enough times that they know it doesn't make any sense to chase them around or go waste your energy before they're ready and they're just laying up and the first ones that actually come in they just go take them it's and, almost uh, like so at five their team a lot less. it's almost like at five their instincts become more honed where they start to you know it's a little more survival based as opposed to yeah and you don't know if that's it or look i mean i don't know if you guys have dogs but i have we have labs you know shed hunting dogs and everything else you got puppies like Linda's got a new 12 week old puppy. They're running around like crazy, bouncing off the walls. Even at you know, two and three years old, your puppies are basically at two years old. They're still almost like puppies bouncing off the wall. But you get a like my dog Tank, seven years old. He's content to lay around all day, saves his energy. You get him out. He's an animal when it, you get out, you know, shed hunting or or hunting. But they're pretty content to lay under the table, you know, and not waste their energy. Until it's time to go, he knows. You know, I get my shotguns out or something, man. There now he's now he's acting like he's a puppy again. But until then, he's content to lay around. He's not bouncing off the walls. And I think, you know, deer are the same way. When they're young, they're just up, moving around. They're just bouncing off the walls, for, for to say like like a puppy. When they get a certain age, they're like five is what I see. They're pretty content to lay under the table all day until they have a reason to get up. So it could be that. And I think a lot of it is, you know, like I said, they are getting smarter. They've been through hunting season. They've been through the ruts, they know, okay, I had no sense chasing these does around, wasting my energy, but a lot of it's just, they're getting old, just like people, too, you know, kids are running around like crazy, and you get to get older, you're kind of content to lay on the couch and watch the news, you know, so I think a lot of it's just, you know, they're just, the age-wise, when they get to five, they turn the corner where, hey, I'm not getting up unless I have a reason to get up. 
hey, we don't want to take all of all of Lee's day, although we could. Um, <laughs> Todd, <yeah. laughs> um, you want to ask one more question, and then I've got one more question for Lee, and then we'll wrap things up if that's okay. Yeah. Is that okay with you, Lee? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Okay. I, yeah, anytime I'm talking deer, I love it. We do you know, <laughs> radio shows of all the time. You know, it's like as soon as I'm off, I'll be out checking cameras someplace or anything. But you know, it's like anytime you can talk deer, I just I can talk deer all day. So well, you you gave me your phone number, so um. <laughs> yeah, anytime you guys for sure. Well, and I, I'm the same way. And what I the way I look at it is, I don't get the opportunity to talk to guys who have been there and done it on so much land. And I've got a two part question, and I'm going to try to keep it quick on one of them. My first question is, I, I had Brad Cooner, one of my good buddies, came down and hunted um, down here on my farm, and, um, and and at the end of the hunt, and he's very he used to hunt with Andre with us over years and years ago. He's one of my uh-huh. favorite, oh, dude, he's an insane hunter. But he said to me, he's like, you know, he's like, I don't mean to like dig your farm or anything, dig on your farm or anything, but he's like, I've never seen so many like junk young deer, like spike horns, four corns, little six points. He's like, you know, when I we used to hunt on. You know, Andre's plays over in Illinois. He's like, dude, every deer had a rack, you know, a cage. At what point, what age do you kill crap bucks? And is there any right age, Lee? I mean, how do you how do you do it on your farms? Like, I'm not looking at as big of a picture as you. You can probably be a little bit more um, bounced to the farm where you've got the best genetics potentially. But like for my farm where it's probably a little bit more what most guys are, are used to, you know, managing a smaller farm. Is there a time where you start shooting deer at three years old, two years old? Cause I honestly don't know. Never. Everything, everything gets to five, no matter what, I don't care if it's a spike because you look at, I mean, some people may, I don't know that you can influence genetics unless you have a high fence. I um, mean, you talk to some, you know, some people think you can, you know, you go to Texas, everything is any, any four point, you know, they're always going to be a four point, you know, or, or an eight, you know, uh, I just, I don't really feel that way. I don't I mean, I, we can, I've been here long enough now that I see the good genetics come and go. You'll have years on, let's just take my home farm here, for instance, you know, when we first got here, we had that real big one back behind the house here. And, and, you know, we had a bunch of bucks, really good ones with, inside points and that was the big thing and there was a lot of genetic with the double rows of points and stuff and then it went all that was gone and it, for several years we just had old crappy eight points you could never hardly even find a 10 point and you're like i don't know what happened you know and then all of a sudden now the last couple of years you see all those genetics coming back and you know because your big your big deer will your good genetic deer are bred breeding does here when those fawns are born those fawns aren't staying here. I mean, that's when their does are kicking them out and they're going on to your neighbor's pieces and, you know, whatever's on your neighbors are likely coming back over here, but it all comes and goes, you know, so all those fawns that were kicked out, maybe they're living somewhere close by anyway with those good genetics. And then when they get old enough, they're breeding does and then their does are coming back. Those fawns are coming back over here. You see the different genetics come through. But for me, I always just like, even if it's a, an A point, you just don't know what they're going to do something that might be junky early on isn't necessarily going to be junky. I mean, they're not going to be like a 200 inch or anything like that, but if I get them to five and that's not how, you know, I have buddies that come down and hunt and stuff too. If you, you know, you shoot a three year old eight, that's 117 inches. It's, you know, they're likely going to cut the horns off and throw it on the wood pile. But you know, you leave that deer to five and now even if they might be 145 or 150 inch, eight point and that's huge i mean a lot of times when they get to five they're not just clean eights they'll normally have stickers at the bases or splits or doing something so anytime you hit you shoot a deer and you you get them on the ground they got this huge body and huge neck and a big cinder block head i'm always pumped about it it doesn't matter if they have a 130 inch rack on them it's like man you know you you let them get to his full potential and you just don't know what their full potential is all the time you look at like Wally that Tiffany shot was her biggest deer at the, and man yeah, still is, but that deer was basically, you know, at three years old, we called him Wally because he had a wall of points. I mean, he had like seven on one side and six on the other. I was like, man, that thing could be huge. And it was on the same farm that I shot Gnarls Barkley. That was, you know, 190 something inch, basically almost as a mainframe eight point, but he had some stickers and stuff, but you know, just huge mass and the 
time length was incredible. So you're like, man, it must be this, you know, he was kind of narrow like that. And it's like, man, I think that thing has the genetics of, of, of gnarls and throws up this huge long points and mass and everything. And he's got seven points on the side and six on the other side instead of four. And then I think it'd be a 240. But as he went through, you know, to three years old and to four years old, he never really got, he was super narrow and never put the time length on. He'd get more mass, but he was, you know, even at, we tried to hunt him at five and then, and, and didn't get him. And then he, he hunted him at six. And then, then he broke a, broke part of his beam off. Well, let's just leave him, see what he does. And so basically by the time he got to like seven and even all through those years, five, six, and seven, he was basically kind of a management deer. Let's face it. I mean, he was maybe 160, but which doesn't sound like a management deer. And one of those, years, he might've even been close to 170. And I'm, well, that's not a management deer. But if you look at it, he's got, you know, 15 or 16 points and some stickers, you know, that's, he wasn't very big. I mean, short times and, and only like a 10 or 12 inch inside spread. So you're like, you were just trying to get him out of there basically at that point. Cause you know, he wasn't going to blow into something like, like Narrows was. But then all of a sudden at eight years old, he put that second big beam out of there. And I mean, he had, and he was, he was 190 something inch deer. I mean, he, he put on by 30 inches from the previous years. You're like, man, I'm glad we didn't shoot him. Cause he would have been, you know, it was a cool deer at five and six, but who would have ever guessed it? You know, he'd go from the high sixties or somewhere in the sixties, probably the best rack that he ever had to 190 something. And not that a lot of those eight points will ever do that, but we see a lot of them, you know, put up fours, put up stickers, big, huge bases and, and, and stuff out of there. And some of them will always just be junky, but I always give them that, you know, to five, no matter what, because they're, they're a trophy, you know, just in their, their body, let alone their rack. And if you shoot them at three, there's nothing trophy about them. So, I mean, I don't think we can, in, as wild deer, I don't think we can influence the, uh, the genetics much. Uh, you can take those out, but this, you know, it still seems like, you know, just ones from neighboring properties will come in and go, unless you're in a high fence, I don't think you can really affect the genetics that much. Um, and because so much of the genetics is, is in the does and you just don't know what genetics they have. So I, I would just leave, leave things until five. And it's a perfect example. My first big one I shot this year, 202 inches the year before he was like, he was like 160 inch deer. And we would have shot him that year too. Cause he was five. He just happened to be on a, a small farm, only 80 acre farm. And, you know, two years ago he was there and it's like, yeah, it looks like, a, you know, he's like a, a four year old. So let's leave him. And he had, you know, he always had like an extra sticker at his two and, and but he always had short fours and, and, you know, at four, I thought, yeah, he could be a good one. And he was a 10, he had short fours, but he had a sticker off his two. And then at, uh, at five, he didn't do a whole bunch. You know, he was probably in the sixties. And so there was like four bucks over there that were five years old. And it just, it doesn't happen that way very often that you stack that many, you know, five year olds in there. And of course, they're not all living there. It was only an 80 acre, but it, you know, had does and we had good food on there. So they were, they were coming in there quite a bit, checking out does and stuff. And through the summer, they were coming in there. Um, you know, we had a feeder there in the summer when you can, and then you got to take them out, you know, for the hunting season. But then we had, you know, giant food plots on there too. So it just, you know, we would have probably shot him at five. And that was one that Tiffany was, was looking for. There was like three or three, five-year-old bucks. So, and she ended up shooting one of them and then, then my buddy Adam shot another one of them, and he was one that we just never saw much. And I found a shed out there, though, so I knew he was still alive last year. And like I said, that shed, you, put, you hold the shed up to his rack this year, and that, that, that shed was 60, 67 inches, and it was 103 the next year. So the difference from five to six, you just don't know when they're going to blow up. So, I mean, a lot of times, of course, he was still a 10. He wasn't like a, a junk deer. I mean, he was a, a pretty good deer. But you just don't know what they're going to do. So we just leave everything till five. I don't think that you can influence the genetics much on wild deer. And they're always a trophy when they get to five or six, um, no matter even if they don't have a, a big rack to me, just the body-wise. So, and, you know, if somebody says that, you know, to you, uh, Todd, you know, I get you know, so many little deer, you always see rack deer. But, heck, the more, you know, spikies and forkies and young deer you see, I mean, that's just 
better you got a good crop of bucks coming up because you know you don't know as 200 inch deer you know they could have been spikes if, you know forkies at a year and a half they're not necessarily any different than any other one at one or at a year and a half so I, i'd be just like yeah i'm glad that I'm, we're seeing a lot of a lot of boxes you just don't know I mean, what they're going to turn into i have the exact same trophy philosophy as you i i mean that pretty much that's how i've been uh, managing my farm and i think because we're both from the upper midwest like from country where you know a, a 130 yeah. class buck was a big buck growing up i mean I, oh yeah I saw a couple of them, so just like you man i walk up on these on any of these big mature deer and they impress the heck out of you no matter what and i'm just like a little kid again you know um so i think that's one advantage i think of of being born out of a state of iowa because i'm friends with uh tyler tish who's one of my good buddies um mm-hmm. and he grew up he grew up hunting here in iowa and he's like a spoiled rotten little kid you know uh, i just saw <laughs> you know another junk freaking 150 class or whatever i'm just like dude i still get pumped seeing a a 130 class three-year-old until I'm like, okay, it's only a 130 class three-year-old. But right. at first, at first, like, glimpse of the rack, man, it gets my heart pumping every single time. And I think, you know, in some way, shape, or form, I'm glad I wasn't born into a, a big-time hunting. Yeah, game. I mean, even, I remember Bill Winky telling me years and years ago, probably 20 years ago, I mean, I've known Bill forever. And and even in writing, you know, he'd say, you got to be careful on, you know, saying, well, it was just, you know, passing 150 inch deer. He said, 90% of the country, 90% of the hunters in this country will never see a 150 in their lifetime. And that is true. I mean, you go, you know, there's so many hunters like over on the East coast and, 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 and in the South, I mean, that's where, you know, you think of Pennsylvania and that whole Eastern coast, you know, the Carolinas and New York's and, I mean, that's where the population of people are, and the, there's more hunters there, and talking to Alabama and Georgia and all that. I mean, a 150 is one that most of those people, not that they don't shoot a lot of you know 150s and stuff in those states, but so the average hunter will never see a 150. So we, you know, you can't just go out there and be, you know, like I said, we're lucky that we, we live here. But he's like in writing, and, and even for us and on TV, we don't say, oh, there's just a crappy 150. Um, because most people, uh, you know, they'll look at you like you're what a deer snob, you know, I'll never see a 150 in my lifetime. And you're acting like uh, you're sloughing it off like nothing. So we are lucky, but like you said, you get jaded to that. And that's why, like I have buddies come, you know, there's times that we have a lot of the old deer that are, you know, are never going to be giants, but normally if normally if we let them get to five, they'll always be close to 150 if not over 150 so there's a lot of deer that you know big old ones at 155 one you know 160 that's the that'll be like a lot of my buddies and stuff that still come down and hunt and just you know even even lovey uh my, my one of the best friends my camera guy who you know hunted with me forever um he's filmed me on about every hunt i've ever done he he finally got drawn this year and came and he shot and just i don't even know how old this deer is i mean he just showed up and it was like the body on the thing is probably one of the biggest bodies I've ever seen. And his face, I mean, he had to be like, you know, seven, eight year old buck. And he was like 154. Um, just heavy, but and his points, you know, his times weren't that long, but they were fat. I mean, they were about as big around as his main beans and stuff. But he was like 154, 155 inch deer. And uh, to me, I, I was more pumped about that deer than, about, than anything that we shot this year. And just to see Jeff, just to be in the in a blind with with Jeff when he when he shot him and how pumped he was. I mean, it's the biggest deer he's ever shot in his life. And you know, so a deer like that, you know, when he if he said, well, you know, if he just got he's not that big at three or four. Let's just call him out. He's never going to be big. I mean, it's, I mean, a deer like that are trophies of a lifetime for most people. So you don't want to slough those off and just you know, I am just going to kill them at three because they're not good genetics. Because I have you know a lot of buddies that come and they shoot something like that and. Heck, it's going to be on their wall and be the biggest deer they've ever shot. You know, you get them to five. So yeah. we don't, you know, we don't ever shoot anything until they're five. I don't care what kind of genetics they have. Oh, well, I, it's, it's always good to hear that because it kind of reaffirms my, um, my belief in, uh, in the Lakoskis because that was the one thing that always struck me about you, Lee, was that no matter what, no matter how successful you've gotten, which has been out of, out of control to watch, we've all been like just standing back in awe of what you guys have done, but you've never lost what got you here in the first place, which is the passion for whitetails and 
it's so refreshing to see that because, and that's why you've been so successful because you've never lost that. And I think that's the reason I'm, well, I'm no different than I was as a kid. And like I said, like, like I grew up in in the first 12 years that I deer hunted, I bet you I didn't see 12 deer. (laughs) Um, and you know, the, the first, before I started bow hunting, it's at the, I mean, I was my, my 20 years old by the time I started, uh, uh, but actually being you know, shooting anything with my bow, I had, I shot two bucks and, you know, from the time I started hunting that, you know, nine or 10 years old with my dad. till I was 20, I shot two bucks. One was a forky that was maybe, maybe 50 inches. And then one was a little eight point that was maybe 80 inches. So that was it. That's, I mean, for, you know, 12, 13 years of hunting, you know, and, and just being eaten up with deer, read every single magazine, everything that I could, um, that was, I was in my 20s before I shot my first Pope and Young. It wasn't until I started, you know, I could take my car and get me a license and start driving around and knocking on doors and and and, and trying to find places where I could bow hunt in the city, you know, more where, you know, maybe there wasn't the gun pressure. It was only shotguns and not rifles and stuff. and start learning, you know, and, and shooting some, some bigger ones. So I didn't grow up that way. I was, I've always been infatuated. I mean, Tiffany asked me, he said, how are you so infatuated with deer when you never saw any growing up hunting in northern Minnesota? I said, well, because I, I always thought I'd see all the magazines and see, I always thought that it was me, that I wasn't good enough. I just didn't know how to hunt. I didn't know where to hunt. I wasn't good enough. I always figured that those deer were there, and I just wasn't a good enough hunter. So that just, it just drove me and drove me and drove me and just got obsessed with it. And, you know, you know, now that there likely wasn't, I mean, it was with the wolves and the snow and everything in northern Minnesota, it was a public land and stuff that there just were hardly any deer there. And there, you know, there could have been some decent deer, but, you know, I bet you, you know, if I went up there now, knowing what I know now, you know, you could likely get racked bucks, you know, fairly often. But, you know, there just wasn't the deer there, you know. You and, to- and now I look in places that we hunted, it's like, well, no wonder we didn't see him, man. We're in the wide open birch bark timber, you know, cause it was beautiful. You could see a long ways, but no bucks in their right mind would be walking through that open timber like that up in, up in that area. And this goes back to even what we talked to about, you know, there, there's nobody in there for nine months, 10, 11 months of the year. There's nobody in there. You're talking just, just timber. There's no field, just massive pieces of timber. You get to gun season, you know, opening day, and but leading up to it, even like the week before, everybody's going and building scaffolds and building stands. We, you know, there was no hang-ons and stuff back then, and we just built stands in the trees. Those deer knew, you know, holy crap, there'd been nobody in here for ten months, and all of a sudden, you know, the Orange Army comes out, and it's like they were under. They must, who knows? It's like they built tunnels that go in or something. You never saw one, but it goes back to you know the you know constant pressure, or you know, or constant, you know want to say pressure but constant you know getting them used to you that you're there and you know we talked about that earlier and that's that's huge you know just getting your deer used to people being around all the time without without any intrusion on them or not any harm to them and we could see that like in linda's house tiffany's mom we have put a feeder right like 50 yards in front of her yard in front of her door and you'd see two in the morning you'd see some deer in there and you'd walk by the window and they'd run but, you know, two years later, heck, we can drive our cars in and out, and the deer don't even run from there. Now, we have 170-inch bucks laying in their yard, and so cause we don't hunt anywhere. I sit on that 80 around our house. We don't hunt anywhere around there because we love seeing the deer. But those deer are just like, you know, there, there's deer that we've shot before that are up on, you know, 100 acres away up on a food plot. You, know, you, can, you might catch them, but it's only been like one or two that even we've ever seen, like down by the house. But... You know, we just love seeing them. But those deer, you know, we let our dogs out to go to the bathroom. They go out. They know not. They don't chase deer, and then just go out and go to the bathroom, come back in. The deer don't even run. I mean, it's not just because of the feet are there. I mean, around our whole house. I'm sure you've been there, Todd. There's food plots around the whole thing. Alfalfa fields, bean fields, clover fields. So I mean, you can look out our yard, and there'll be a hundred deer out there if you look out all four windows around our whole house. You know, so it's not just a feeder. They'll come over and hit that once in a while. But they're just so used to us being around there that the deer don't even run and you look at it it's like you know two years before that they'd be at two in the morning and you'd walk by the window and they'd run so you learn that it's not human scent that they're afraid of it's just when there's no human scent and all of a sudden you start coming in now it's something is different but when you're going into our food plots like all every month of the year twice 
two, three times a, a week, going in there, checking food plots, checking cameras, out walking around, you know, fertilizing, checking your plants, stuff throughout the summer. You're always in there twice a week, and, it, and a lot of times I'm going in there and putting out, you know, minerals or filling feeders, some of their – for nine months of the year, they're they're associating me with food or something positive. A lot of times, they'll go out and, they'll, you know, put out, you know, fill the feeders. Two minutes after I'm gone, they'll all come in because they heard my truck coming in. Okay, he must have. Because every time I go in, I check the feeders. Uh, some of them have the spin feeders. I'll make the spin, make sure the spinner's working and and it's going and filling the pan up and stuff. So, you know, hey, there's food. And they hear me coming, they'll come out and they'll check that pan, you know, to see if I. Because I'll always hit the test to make sure that they're working and see how much corn is left in them. So they're used to me with positive things, with food, nine months of the year. And then when it gets to hunting season, you're, you're hunting it the same way, like twice a week maybe in there. So to them, July looks no different than November. And I think that's why we've been so successful is that you know, those deer don't, don't recognize that they're being hunted. It, it's no different to them than in, in July. But when we were hunting like northern Minnesota as kids and stuff, there was nobody in all that big national forest up there you know, nobody. And then all of a sudden you got to hunting season and the orange army came out and they were everywhere. So the deer knew it was totally different, you know, like so a, that and we were just so unsuccessful back then. And you kind of can see why now, I mean, if I, if I just knew back then, which, you know, now you likely, you know, it's not like you'd be shooting giant deer or even every year, but yeah, it would have been a lot more successful than I was back then. For sure. You learned a lot since then. The perfect analogy is it'd be like any of us waking up tomorrow morning and finding a seven-year-old buck in our living room. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, that's not normal. Lee, I'm not kidding you. Just this year, my farm, I've the success ratio of actually killing these big bucks as opposed to the trail camera success, you know, getting pictures of them, is when, yeah. I, when my wife and I started enjoying our property more. And I finally got to the point where I was sick. I had enough... Uh, pieces around me and, and control enough where I just didn't care anymore. I'm like, you know what? She loves to go down to, to our creek, which is right next to my sanctuary, the best spot I got. And she uh -huh. likes to go down there and collect rocks and play around in the water and stuff. And we're down there, I mean, not every day in the summer, but I bet you a few times a week. So yeah. I started I started just to notice that during season, when I'm walking across my whole property to get in these secure locations, deer would just snort and snort and snort and, and you know before you even get into your blinds or your stands you're like you don't you feel like turning around and going to a different spot um mm -hmm. so now i drive my truck right down to the creek i park and i have where i killed my, uh, one of my big eights this year i i was literally parked within 150 yards of where he was at and what i figured out is i'll blow the deer out but it's a different type of blowout they'll just run off and then they'll run back it right back in and exactly. i actually I have pictures of deer feeding within 20, 30 yards of my truck right on scrapes because I, I had to drive to one spot to get in the creek access to get into different stands and stuff. And they've just, it's a piece of farm equipment to them now. They're just used to it. Right. And, and it, like I said, I mean, we, I drive my range like I, every day I go, you know, check someplace. Obviously, it's not every day on the same farm because we've got lots of different farms. But every day I'm out checking cameras and looking at, fields and and doing stuff like that so they're used to you and you know you have people always like oh when you put your cameras out do you use rubber gloves i said no i want them they get a snout full of lean tiffany every single day so then when you go to the hunting season you do everything you can for scent control and you know you can't get away with it. i mean you can you know they can smell as good as a dog and you know they have drug dogs you can put drugs in a injection molded inside of a plastic ball and put it in your gas tank and they're going to smell it so it's not like you're ever going to get away with it. The difference is you do everything, everything possible, and they get downwind to you, put their nose up, do the head bob, do the stomp, flick their tail, and walk through. So it's either they think, okay, it's weak enough scent that it was yesterday that they were here, or two hours ago they were here, or he's 200 yards away, not 20 yards away. And we get away with murder. I mean, the, my last big one, that 207 that I shot this year, we had to go in there with a terrible wind because that's that's all we had this south wind. We didn't have a, a choice, and with gun season coming, I knew that deer. I had never seen him. Nobody. We had hunted that farm hundreds of times before, and never saw that deer, even though I had some pictures of him. And then late season last year, all of a sudden he started using this one rack radish field that I have, and he just started living in there late season, and then he kind of did that. Got to the end of October, he was in there all the time. That's when I started hunting him, and all of a sudden he was just like we talked about earlier, 
I did. They had never been visible. Never, nobody had ever saw him, even though we hunted that farm hundreds of times over the four years that he was in there. Nobody ever saw him. And then this year, all of a sudden, why? He just, bang, he was visible in that field all the time. But it's real close to some neighboring property. And I was like, in the gun season, being as visible as he is, he's never going to, you know, somebody's going to kill him in gun season because I wasn't going to shoot him with a gun. I was like, I'm adamant I'm going to shoot this with a bow or I'm not going to shoot him at all. And so, I mean, I ended up shooting him just literally three days before the gun season. But it was south wind, and as I get blown right in the timber he's coming from, and all the does are coming out to this, back to a cornfield. And I was like, I don't have a choice, though. And we just did everything we could with spraying down, sent killer soap and, and, and washed all our clothes and sprayed them down and did, did everything we possibly could. And it was not so much him, but all the does coming out because the, all the deer would start stacking in the field. One doe blows behind you, it blows the whole field. And then you're screwed for the night, you know, if you can't get them back in. But we had so many does coming right out from downwind. And every one of them, some of them would turn around and walk back and wouldn't come out. And some of them would walk right through. And then later, those ones that would walk back with their fawns, they'd, all right, get enough, let's get enough courage up, and yep, we'll walk out there. But they'd see all those deer out in the field, because once they're in the field, we were in the clear. And it was like right at last light, nothing blue. This is two nights in a row we did this. And boom, here he comes from, he, he was from behind us somewhere. We didn't walk out right underneath us. He walked down the cornfield farther, and walked down the edge of the corn, and then walked into our, our cornfield and shot him at 52 yards. But, you know, I think if you had never been in there before, they smell any human like that. They would have been blowing and going uh, if, if they'd never smelled you before. So I think that, you know, like we talk about at Linda's yard and then, you know, like when I was a kid and, and there's a, there was a really wealthy community in, in Minnesota because it was North Oaks. And so everyone would go up there and shed hunt and look at deer and take pictures of deer because they were all over. You'd see 180 inch deer in people's yards and laying in their yards. And so they're all over. And it wasn't because they weren't smelling people. It was because they smell them every day and you couldn't hunt in there. You know, so they never got bothered. So that's the way you want your place to be where they're used to humans and used to human scent and used to you being around, but you're not bothering them for nine or 10 months of the year. Then you get to hunting season, you can get away with stuff like that, that you couldn't otherwise. And it's, a hundred percent. I mean, just because you can see it, you see in the housing developments where deer live, you see it at you know Linda's house and the, you know, the other hundred deer laying in her yard and all over out there. You can walk out, especially Linda, she's in and out. She can drive her car and deer don't even run, you know, at all. I mean, they might run 20 yards away from her and stand there and look at her and start eating again. Oh, it's just Linda coming again. So you can condition the deer to, you know, to be a lot more tolerant of you being in there by being in there and you know we used to write articles and you talk about before you know no pressure keep all uh, you know no pressure at all in there and it's like it's not that you want no pressure you want consistent pressure over 12 months of the year and not just you know if you stay out of there you don't you don't walk in your farm for 10 months of the year and you get to opening day and start hunting it a deer is like i saw you know. with danger now and it's not it, you're not getting away with what you did before Part of what I, I love about, and this will be my, my closing thoughts on it, and it's something that over the years have killed a lot of big bucks for me, and I know has probably killed a billion deer for you and Tiffany, too. You know, guys, if you're going to sit around and wait for the perfect win all season long, you know, th- sometimes it just does not happen, and there are times when you just have to take the risk, and you have to follow your gut and kind of follow the, the recipe of no risk, no reward, but you've got to be willing to potentially blow one out in order to kill it sometimes. Um, and mm-hmm. I'd rather take that chance at something like, my God, what you're killing, Lee, 207 and a 202 in the same year. You don't get opportunities at those deer by playing it safe all the time, do you? We're just going to take a quick break from the show here to hear about a special offer that Todd learned about yesterday from Ozonix. Hey everybody, this is Todd from White Knuckle Productions. I just wanted to let you know about a promotion that Ozonix is doing now. I don't know if you've heard or Ozonix is a direct cons- to consumer only now, which means that basically you can't buy them anywhere else except directly through uh, Ozonix, which uh, is absolutely crazy, but they've got the product for it because it is absolutely the best scent elimination product on the market. It's the only thing I ever found to consist 
consistently beat big white tails no so now the deal is you got to go to ozonicshunting.com and they are selling a brand new unit called the 230 this is a specific promotion for this unit it is basically the 200 frame which is the the original uh, plastic frame and it also features the dry wash mode, which allows you to clean your clothes. It's a specific setting uh, that does a different thing with the ozone molecules uh, and the way it distributes it over your clothing. It is the best bang for your buck because you need to have a unit in the field while you're hunting, not just treat your clothing. If you don't have both, you're you're done, uh, in my opinion. The only thing I would say is you got to go to their website. The price is three hundred and forty nine bucks. Uh, and that's $50 less than last year's 200 model. Hey, this is a limited time only deal through White Knuckle Productions. We have been partnered with Ozonics for many, many years now, as I am an absolute fanatic and believer in their system. And I've used it to kill a lot of big bucks over the years. So only by using the ozonicshunting.com backslash WKP, you, that's the only way you can get the deal, which comes with a free dry wash bag and a $50 discount. You cannot beat it. No, no. And and the thing is, the good thing about it is you don't want to bump a deer too many times, you know, like in the same spot. But these deer, I mean, over the whole summer, you know, like I come into the fields and if I don't, you know, I don't hunt the timber as much as I used to because, I, you know, I always, I'm always in the fields all summer. And they'll run off the field. They'll run to the edge of the field and sit there and look at you. And as soon as you leave, they come back out. So they get used to you being there. It's not like they're going to stand there and just keep eating and let you walk by them or anything like that. Obviously, they're wild deer. They're going to run to the woods. But So when I start going into the timber, then then their next step is to maybe run to my neighbors and wait there and then come back. So I don't want them like, leaving my timber. So that's why I don't go in the timber a lot other than like shed season and stuff. And that's where it comes back to you know, when do we hunt the timber. And, and you know, I'm more cautious about that because I don't go in there a lot you know, cause I don't want them to run into my neighbors. And even now, like I, I don't shed hunt in the, in the timber yet until I see about 80% down, which is normally around, you know, February 20th or 25th, but it's a little bit earlier this year when they're dropping. But when I see about 80% of them down, or if I have a real big young one or something that we didn't, or a giant that we didn't hunt, as soon as I see them down, I'm, I don't care what I'm going in there and finding them before you, know, you get a trespasser in there, or squirrels eat them or, or whatever. But, uh, you know, so if I don't go into the timber a bunch, because even like this time, I don't want to run, go in the timber and have them run to my neighbors and drop horns on neighboring properties and, and, and things. So, you know, that's where it comes down to I hunt the fields more than the timber because I don't go in there as much. And they're not used to me being in there that much. So, you know, they're used to, they can sneak and walk all over the fields and everything else. And I'm not too worried about bumping them off. And you can buy, you know, you know, those bigger bucks. I mean, I've bumped them out the field a hundred times in the summertime. And you're out there eating, you know, in the field. And you come out and you're checking fields or filling feeders or doing whatever. So they're used to that. And they know, hey, nine months, ten months of the year, like, trucks are coming in here, people are in here. All they got to do is run to the edge of the woods and come back out five minutes later. So I'm not, you know, when I'm hunting the field, that's, I'm, you're, not, it, it, you're not so worried about bumping them there. You know, and it's not like you bump a big one one time and they'll never come back. And it could be if they've never smelled a person in there before. And all of a sudden you start coming in there to hunt, you know, that that's going to change the pattern big time. But if they're used to you being in there and they have been since they're two years old and lived on your property and around that, that, hey, there's always people in here. It's never been a problem. So you can kind of condition them to, to not bail out or turn nocturnal you know, by being there in the summertime and and you know other times of the season so you know it's uh hey, dude, it's kind of counterintuitive to what you think if i had to walk around with a cameraman like big george i wouldn't go in the timber either because <laughs> 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 yeah, you have to have a big dang tree to hold it up oh, and then you know, like you we touched on that a little bit but it's like you said it's hard i mean we really you really got to think out your spots you know carefully and stuff with back cover and you know, thinking about with two people in there and, and even more so is it's amazing what you can get done and how much better hunter you get, especially on the spot and stock stuff. Because a lot of times, like on our mule deer hunts, we have two camera hunts, two cameramen, you know, somebody to be right over your shoulder and get you in there. And then somebody on high speed, you know, to get the animal up close. So the other guy has you and the audio because the main camera is on high speed. So you don't know how tough it is for people to, 
you know, they think, oh, man, are you going to go archery hunting after sheep? Oh, my gosh, the hardest thing in the world. You're going to go spot and stock, you know, elk and coos deer and all that kind of stuff or mule deer. And it's like, well, yeah, now try doing it with three people and sometimes with guides if they're there. You know, but a lot of times the guides don't go with us, you know, now. Most of them know me and they just, hey, we find a deer and they say, yeah, you go get them. You, got, you know what you're doing. You know, I don't have to go help you at all. So, but yeah, they, I mean, it just makes you become so much more careful. Do things, have way more patience. And you just, every time you mule deer hunt, you become a better hunter for whitetails. Every time, you know, you go hunt moose or hunt anything, you just become a better hunter for every game animal because you just become more patient and more, you know, attention to winds and attention to everything, especially when you have, you know, two and three people going in after them to get to accomplish what we do. It, uh, I mean, you learn a lot. You need to be a lot better hunter with the cameraman. And right now, I just think if I went spot stock mule deer, if I spot one bedded down someplace, if I just went hunted by myself, I'd be like, there's 90% chance I'm going to kill that deer right now. You know, where you never would think that normally. But you're so used to going in with two and three people and how slow and how methodically you have to be and so much attention to the wind. You're just way more careful that way. It just makes you become such a better hunter um, with cameramen. And same thing with deer, just as how, where you're going to set your stands, how you're going to set them, you know, making sure that you're not, you're not sticking out like a sore thumb with two people, you know, and two people, the scent of okay, two sir. people and moving the camera has to move, you know, to get on it and all that stuff. It's, and you're uh, not just it makes filming. you a way better hunter. You're not just filming. You're at the absolute top of your game. And I know, I believe me, Lee Lukoski, everything has to be perfect. But you guys are using giant cameras. You're not using little mini cameras like I am, but that's always been a part of your passion is the, the, the videography and the, the storytelling of your hunts and, so for that, you sacrifice a lot of things along the way um, in order to achieve that, dude. I mean, the quality, the top end level quality does not come easy. It's not just a matter of filming it, but capturing it perfectly. And that's yeah, it becomes, you know, as a big of passion as, as the hunt is, because people always will ask you, man, you know, if you ever just want to go and hunt by yourself and just without a camera. And it's like, no, I, it's more if I shot a deer and didn't have it on film i'd be sick about it because i i mean on my phone right now i got little clips of the two deer i shot this year and every other one that i've had over the past 15 years are still on there and i, I look at those things 10 times a day every time i pick up my phone look at pictures oh look at the videos i'm gonna look at that the elk that i shot i mean because i just get such a it just can it's a one way you can bring it back to life like if i shot something you know and without a camera you can tell your buddies about it but it's not the same as showing them. I mean, it's always, a, you, you know how it is. Anytime you shoot one, all your, your buddies come over, your camera guys, and, uh, you know, you know we have, a lot of times we have friends here hunting with us. It's, it's, it's a big event at night to come in and watch people's footage and stuff. If you didn't have that, I mean, I was thinking of my kids. I mean, I hope, like, they won't be around for any grandkids, but, you know, they can go back and watch all that stuff and see the same excitement and, and everything that I had that, you'd, you know, you'd, you'd lose that. You know, that I, I wouldn't care to shoot something without a camera now just because I want to be able to go back and look at those and see those memories and, and things and relive them. So, you know, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a big of an accomplishment of getting beautiful footage and stuff of a hunt as it is of actually shooting the animal because it's shooting. It's the easy part. Finding them. Like we talk about is, is finding a big one, putting yourself in the right spot to have an opportunity at them is, it's much harder than shooting them and then getting it on film and having, you know, perfect footage and daylight and, you know, in focus and everything is great and having a beautiful hunt, everything comes together. I mean, that's, that's a a big feat to do. And that's, you know, like you said, people are always, you know, Oh yeah, try going to my place on public land in Pennsylvania and shoot one. It's like, that's not the hunt. Shooting them is not the hard part. I mean, if you, if you, especially for something like you or I, we get to hunt a hundred days a year and I've shot a lot of different things. I have pretty much 100% confidence you give me an animal inside 70 yards, I'm shooting the thing. You know, I have pretty much confidence in that. To me, I mean, obviously, people, when you just started, you got buck fever and you do dumb things. I did myself, you know, when I had multiple pins. I don't know how far was it. I don't know. I just put all the pins on it and shot. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, believe me, I've done that. You know, I've lived through all that stuff. But at this point in my life, I've hunted enough and shot enough that even though I get just as excited as, as I used to, and you learn how to calm yourself down, and a lot of times it's nice having the camera guy there because it's like, just get some footage of him, Let's see, and then get some pre-roll, get some footage. And it's mostly because I'm trying to control my breathing. I don't want to shoot until 
okay, I got my, I got my breath back. My knees aren't shaking as bad. All right, I'm just I calm myself down, make a good shot. And a lot of times, even when we first started the TV show, it was nice having a cameraman because a lot of these guys, you know, thought, oh man, you know, at least shot a lot of big stuff. You know, it's, it, you know, this should be, this can be awesome. We're going to get stuff. But for me personally, I was like, especially with cameramen, I didn't know. I was like that we just met for the first time or different, you know, we had different people when we first started and stuff that I didn't want to look like a rookie. So a lot of times I remember Jason Miller he used to film for Tom Miranda and stuff. He was on ESPN, filmed all the ESPN shows and stuff. The first time I was elk hunting with him. And it was like my first big elk that I shot. He came into a, walk, a pond. I remember just breathing so heavy and being so shaky and being at full draw thing at 50 something yards. And then I remember telling myself, man, you can't look like an idiot in front of Jason. This is a guy that filmed stuff for ESPN. Just take another breath and, and just bear down on this thing, and you make sure you pick a little spot and you make a perfect shot on this thing. And it just calmed me down. And it, I mean, where I would have, I would have shot a full two minutes earlier, almost on this thing. I would have pulled back, put a pin on shot, and say, "Was your level on? Was you where? Did you have the right pins? All that stuff." I don't know. I just shot. But with having him there, I still remember that to this day. I, I got, I can't look like a, I can't look like a rookie to this guy, and just, okay, settling yourself down, and made a perfect shot on the thing. He went like 50 yards, and it was like so excited on the thing. And I remember it was so, I could hardly breathe. I mean, to the point that you felt like you're going to pass out, and just learn how to control that. And that just helped me so much having somebody else there, which I likely wouldn't have taken my time. And now it's kind of become second nature. You know, you, you know, these camera guys come out and, you know, they're all my, my, my closest friend, like Jeff is with me all the time. You don't want to let them down either. Everybody wants to film a kill and be successful and have, you know, you know, say, man, I, I filmed that kill when they see it on TV. They're proud of it too. And it's beautiful footage amongst all the camera guys, you know, it's kind of a big deal. You get a, a kill that's perfect footage and you do all the cutaways, perfect and recoveries and that, you know, just getting a, a, a perfect hunt is a, is a tough thing to do because, you don't, number one, you don't get a big deer in front of you very often, and then to get everything perfect, it's a big deal to them, too, so you don't want to let them down by missing or doing something, you know, screwing, jacking it up or, or something. So, you know, it really, it, to me, it helps having somebody there calm, to calm you down, and it's just a sense of pride when you put a whole hunt together. You're like, man, that thing, you know, tough that is to get, you know, 200-inch deer or 170-inch deer, 150-inch deer, or, you know, an old deer to put one in front of you, and then to put it all together with the video and everything else, it's, that is tough to do. And, and, and so many people now, I guarantee it, you know, there's everybody, hey, let's go film stuff. Because now with the YouTubes and Facebook stuff, I mean, you know, people, you know, everybody wants to put a, a good hunt out there like that. And I think people are understanding a little bit more now how much more difficult it is <laughs> to do to put a, a good one together and focus and, and have, you know, a beautiful, a beautiful shot. And, and so that's hard to do. It is the feel, is there nothing? I mean, that, like I get to that point now where when you, when you recover the animal, you're standing behind him and you look at the camera, the feeling that you have at that moment of just like, I can't believe we just pulled it off. And now you've done it time and time again. And I have two, but each one is so special because it's not just shooting the deer, man. You've got so many elements that have to come together in one small moment of time that yep. when it does happen it still feels like a miracle every time to me and it's just like yeah there's no redos on it you no know, it will never get old man and that just no matter how hard of a season you had like even if you have to wait a season or two to have that feeling again oh once you've accomplished that um yeah you just want to do it again people like ever get old and say like, no <laughs> it's like nope. no i want to do it again <laughs> you know you just can't wait for the next one i'm already you know you know looking forward to next hunting season and, and Luckily for me, you know, like we start my first sheep hunt will be in August 10th, you know, so it's really not that much time. You, you know, like I see we have Harrisburg show, you know, next next week and then the Dixie Deer Classic, the Minnesota Deer Classic. And, you know, that you're shed hunting through all that. But by the time we're done with show season, you're basically into April and turkey season. And so you're excited about turkey hunting and food plots and planting and doing all that stuff. And it goes by so fast, you know, you got, you know, in April and May, you're you planting corn and beans and clover, and then you get to June and July, and you're fertilizing, getting all your stuff ready for, you know, for your, your turnip and rape and radish mixes. I usually plant those, like, in July to August 1st, and then you get to August 1st, and you think, okay, what didn't make it, what do I got to put in winter wheat? And then, it, and then I'm leaving on August 10th. I have, you know, 
I got Matt and Mike usually planting my wheat fields, you know, because I don't want to really plant them until the end of August. So, I mean, there's really no downtime. And, and through that whole summer, you know, you're putting together all the episodes, your, your shows for the year, and you're doing your interview pieces. Time flies by so fast because there's, there's no downtime. It's always like this is when my hunting season starts. I'm doing all the work now. And uh, before you know it, August is here, and i got to leave for hunting in, in a week, you know. And you're like, God, I wish I had some more time. And, you know, you're, just, you're always struggling to get – stuff done you know every every year you're like, god i should have hinge cut that i should have you know put more apples planted some apple trees and pear trees here i should have done this and that there's it work is never done so you, i never have a day that i get say man it's a lazy day i'm gonna lay around all day you know it's every day you get up even now i'm just okay i get new chains for my chainsaw and get my you know sharpen them up i got so many places that i got hinge cut and thicken up and stuff you see over the season like where i shot that 207 it's like gosh where he's bedding in there you know, he probably would have hung in there more if it wasn't so open, you know, as it gets, as all the leaves fall and everything. I would have liked to have killed him in that little rack radish field, you know, but then it's getting, as the leaves fall, it gets so open in there, he starts moving, so he's over, you know, over on one of our cornfields more. And it's like, man, if I just would have hinge cut that all last year and laid all this stuff down and had at least treetops and, and trees and stuff in there and opened that up with a little more grass, he maybe would have stayed right where he was, where I, you know, I had a better shot at him, and, you know, you said moving stands around. You put up stands for, you know, six stands in a three-acre field, you know, around there. It's 12, you know, 12 stands for six sets and stuff. You know, people go and look at that little three-acre field and like, oh, my gosh, why so many stands in here? Well, if it's southeast or south-southeast, you, you hunt this one. And if it's south, this one. And if it's southwest, you hunt this one. If it's south-southwest, you can hunt this one. You know, for every, you know, now it's not just south, north, south, east, or west. If it's if it's south, southwest, we can hunt this one. And if it's southwest, we have to hunt that one. You know, so it's, you know you're cutting, you're splitting hairs on things, but you have so many setups and stuff for the dang thing. You know, and then all of a sudden he stops using that field and someplace else, because the woods is so open right there now. And, I, but there's I, I, you know, so much work I, to do. Dude, all I can say is Tiffany has got to be the greatest woman on earth because I know how you are. And no this doubt. Is Lee. This is Lee all the time. Like it's, I'm the same way. I'm not quite as you're like on a 180 percent. I'm like 110, maybe, maybe 100. <laughs> but dude, this is you want to. It's higher than 100, oh, Todd. My goodness. Well, I mean, dude, you can just see though. But, but I also I. I have the business. I we're we're too different. You're in one. Your whole business is whitetails. Where my business, I have you know to deal with engineering and product and manufacturing crap. To right. Too. It's it's a different. But that in a nutshell, man, is what makes you um, successful. And 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 there's nobody who deserves the success more than you. So I can't say how uh, excited we are to have you on the show just to talk whitetails. And I think. I mean, all people have to do is talk to you guys, both Tiffany and yourself, um, and you very quickly realize what caliber of work ethic that you guys have. And that's what it comes down to, man. If you don't put the time in, you can't expect to get the results. Exactly. You know, people will see that and they'll try to come hunt here and do that and stuff. You know, cause you know, it's just, you know, jealousy on things, but it's no different than anything. If, if you want to be a doctor, okay, you gotta, you gotta, you're gonna have to work hard through high school to get into a good college. You're gonna have to work hard. It's just going to take hard work and you can get there. It's no different if you want to be a professional athlete. If you have your gifted athlete, you you aren't just starting in college. Yeah, I'm at 20. I'm 20 years old. I'm going to go see if I can play football for for Alabama. Like, no, you played a thousand games. I mean, through five years old and six years, you worked your entire life to get there. And so you see those people. They just didn't step up, and you don't you don't see anybody, you know, telling football players that. Well, gee, well, I could too if I. If I went to Alabama, I could play football too. <laughs> it's like, no, it takes a million, million hours of practice and, and I mean, honing your skills to get there. And that's, you know, people just don't realize that hunting is a sport like anything else. You don't, nobody said to Brett Favre, well, yeah, well, if I could have went to LSU or, or Mississippi or wherever he played, I don't even know. But it's like, you know, I could have been, I could have done that too. It's like, well, it's obvious you probably can't. You couldn't have. You know, you, you spent your whole life trying to get to a certain area for people. And it's no different with deer hunting. It's like you spend the more time you put into it, you spend thousands and thousands of hours to to get, you know, to that point. It's not something like, hey, we just bought a good farm and and 
hey, I blew the dust off my bow October 1st and went out and shot a big one. And people who hunt here know that. I think one of my best friends, Hunter Jobes, is Luke Bryan's best friend and cameraman and everything. He hunted here like 30 days. He's on the same buck that he, that he, and we saw right away and he saw him like 20 out of 30 days and, and he just could never get close enough, could never get an arrow. And he, he went home without shooting one. I mean, that's been 30 days here probably. And, you know, people think, oh, you just go and set up someplace and there's a big deer behind every tree. It's a lot of work. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of time. You just, just like anything, you'll get out of life in general or anything you want to do, what you put into it. Nobody just goes and says, I'm going to be a doctor today. And okay, I'm a doctor tomorrow. It's you. There's a tons of years and years of work and preparation that go into it. And it's the same thing. It's like we shoot big deer now, but it's because he's spent, I've spent the last 40 years, you know, every hour of every day that I've had basically working to get there. Exactly. Uh, you're, you're kind of speaking to what I was going to ask you, Lee, and uh, we'll kind of wrap up the show this way. You know, knowing that um, there's gold at the end of effort, which is basically what you said, and, and having a better plan typically produces a better result. Um, we talked about, you know, there's a whole process that goes on throughout the year. Does it, and you mentioned the word, and, and it's the one thing that I wanted to ask, you know, assuming that you, you know, you listen to all these podcasts and watch all these shows, and there's so much, you know, knowledge to be garnered um, just by reading articles on the internet and what have you. There's tons and tons of resources out there. The one thing that I think a lot of people don't understand and that I wanted to ask you is, does it really just boil down to, uh, assuming you've done all those other things correctly, does it really just boil down to patience? Pretty much, pretty much, because, you know, said we get to hunt every single day, and a lot of times, you know, I said you have pictures, and you, all I got to get is the camera, and know he's there, and just say I got the time. I'm just gonna put in the, put in the hours, and you know, even like you know, we got, you know, tons of food plots on a lot of these farms. It's like you still know over the years, you've learned over the years where you get most of the pictures of that deer, where is he like to spend his time, and it may be just what food plot came in the best, or what food source at this specific time of year they're using, but for me, it just comes down to patience, and you just got to wait them out, and like, I'll have my buddy Lee Murphy, who I've hunted with since I was in high school, and you know, we'll go shed hunting, he's like, man, this, I'm telling you, this is where you got to be, and he is awesome, he knows deer, I mean, he's been spent 70 years, you know, and he's passionate about white tails as I am, and, you know, this is where you need to be, I'm telling you, we need to have a stand here for the rut, it's like, perfect, and he's like, Murphy, I, I, I would agree with you 100% if I had one week vacation and I had to, and that's what I had, you'd have to pull out all the stops. But I said, I've got 100 days. I'm going to sit on the food pots and I'm going to catch them out here. Because if I start going in the timber and stuff, that's not places that I am normally during the summer like we talked about. And it's different to them. I can start, they might start, eh, what's going on here? There's nobody in the timber here, you know, the rest of the year why is somebody in here now and i just don't want to change any patterns of the deer because now you're getting daylight pictures of our big bucks and i only always do and and you know it's like i don't want to do anything to change those patterns if they're starting to use it in daylight and i'm getting daylight pictures of them start going in the woods and stuff maybe something's different about it but they're used to people in the field so i just got time on my side so patience on it which a lot of people don't you know i mean we're very lucky in that way you know, that's one big difference. You know, people say, well, you try to come here and hunt something. It's like my, most people don't have 100 days that they can just say, okay, I'm going to wait this out. And, of course, I'm not, I'm not going to hunt that particular field for 100 days straight. You know, but that's what's nice about having several farms and you've got other deer, you've got several of you that are on my hit list. I don't have to just hammer one because if I, even if I start going into that same food plot like five you know, no problem doing it like five and six days if the, the weather, wind is right and stuff. But I'll see if I get any more than that. It's like, man, that's just too much. And I got to back out and get to a different, you know, a different farm or something. Just stay out of here for a couple of days anyway. So you got to, it's nice to have backup places that you can go to. You don't want to, you know, start getting too much in there. But I'm not afraid to do, you know, four, five, six, maybe even days in a row. And a lot of times, even if I start going out like that, when I start getting close to gun season on that 207, I just, I didn't hunt the same field. And then I started going to some of the timber hunts 
in there, and then some of the other fields and stuff where I've had pictures of them on. And it's just because, it's like, hey, if I don't hunt this farm, I don't have a chance of shooting them. So, you know, even though it's on the cornfield where I ended up shooting them on, but very few pictures, he was always almost always on that rack radish field throughout the whole year. So I, there's a couple pictures of him at night over in that cornfield, so I, I'll go hunt over there, and maybe he'll show up. And then as we start getting closer to December, he starts showing up there more often, and that's so it was good for me that I had more options, and that's actually where I ended up shooting him at. But it is, it's all about you know, patience and just putting in the time. I was with the camera's got to tell me is that he's still there, um, and I just figure I'll catch him sooner or later. And if I know the farms, you have an idea where most of them move, uh, this, I'll, I'll catch him eventually. And that's knowing what happens. It's usually never on the first day. It's usually day 72 of hunting them that, that you, you get, you know, you get a shot at them. Once in a while, you get lucky, but, uh, you know, and kill one right away, but that's normally not the case. And a lot of times that you don't, you don't even get them. You hunt a hundred days for deer and you never get a shot at them. You never have a, you know, sometimes you, see him a couple of times and never get a shot and hey that's how they get to seven years old and eight years old so a lot of deer you know get past you even when you put that many days in on them yeah i don't think truer words have ever been spoken we've all uh we've all felt the pain of that big one getting by us so with that we'll close out the show today i want to thank lee uh for taking the time to uh, spend so much time with us. Uh, it was a pleasure to listen to him and Todd talk and, and just soak up all the knowledge that those two have to share. We'll definitely have Lee back on the show later in the year and we'll narrow down on some topics. If you have a topic that you would like us to ask Lee about, be sure to give us a shout out on any of our social media channels or email me, jason at whitenuckleproductions.com. With that, we'll close out the show for the day. Thanks again, Lee, for taking the time out of your day to spend with Todd and I. It was definitely a ton of fun, and we'll definitely do it again. Uh, with that, we want to thank our sponsor of the show, Ozonics, for uh, making this show possible to bring to all of you guys. Uh, if you didn't see, uh, Ozonix just put out a brand new unit. Go to their website, ozonixhunting.com, and check out the new HR that they just released here this last week.